Hi guys, can you, you can hear me okay? This is good. Whoa, blinding. Okay, hi, my name is Dhruv Bunsel. I'm going to be giving this talk. It's called Down the Rabbit Hole, a series of increasingly harebrained blockchain schemes. Um, I'm going to try and get through like five increasingly harebrained schemes. This, uh, this graph is accurate. You're going to have to really up your um, tolerance level for weird bullshit during the course of this. It's all cultivated bullshit though, which I believe is in the grandest uh, bar tradition. Um, to declare, I suppose, when I start up here. So I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. By, by no means would I agree with that label, but I do at the same time believe Bitcoin, eh, it's sound money, or it's the best we have right now for sound money, and it will become the basis of the global economy. Feel free to disagree. Um, I think there's three major lessons that I have learned from Bitcoin, like these are my ways of putting it, and I'm gonna try in these various schemes that I concoct or talk about over the course of, how long do I have? Oh God, I should have checked. All right, of course, maybe the next half hour or so. Um, I'm gonna try and like, like reason from these lessons, from these kind of teachings, okay? And the first one, simple, money is made up. All right, all right. <laughs> it does matter, but it is made up. Um, stateless socialism, I don't know if that's a, like a phrase, but it feels like people are eager to own the means of production like directly, like socialism is weird because like you can't directly own the means of production, so like let's give the state ownership of that, whatever the state is. Thank you for expanding my mind on that earlier. Um, and Bismuth Adams, I like this one, right? Blockchains, Bitcoins, they're totally made up digital concepts, but they move atoms in the world. They move us to be at conferences like this. We're made of atoms, but I think more interestingly, they cause all sorts of real world hardware, networks, data centers, transportation schemes. Like, this stuff gets built in support of a completely made up electronic digital protocol. So I think that's really exciting. When you think about um, how can economic incentives shape the world, they really do, bits move atoms. Um, so scheme number one, I call this the Nakamoto point. We'll, I'll define that in a little bit. Um, I, I love this drawing, it's, it's a little silly. I don't, I don't believe necessarily um, some of the more macabre visualizations that my friend Daniel likes to put out, but I do like this drawing. Um, <laughs> It's turning into Bitcoin. We might actually all be made of Bitcoin, but that's scheme number five, I'll get back to that. Um, here's a chart of Bitcoin's value. It's a small fraction, guys, of today's money. That's, that's true. This, I updated the Bitcoin figure recently. Some of these are probably old. I stole this from somewhere. Um, okay, so Bitcoin can probably grow by a factor of 100 to 1,000 X. Let's just, just, in, just sort of putting some numbers out there for you guys. Bitcoin can grow by maybe 100 to 1,000 X before it becomes like a really appreciable fraction of world money. It's like less than a, less than a hundredth or a thousandth of percent right now. Um, that same story is true for energy. People bitch and moan sometimes about proof of work and how much energy it uses and how dirty it is. Jeremy's smiling because we had this conversation earlier. Um, but it actually uses a tiny amount of energy if you think about it. I mean, well, a lot. It uses about a nuclear power plant's worth of energy. But if you compare like kind of like the y-axis on these two charts, I mean, Bitcoin is at like 60, 70 terawatts per year, terawatt hours per year, excuse me. And that's, that's a, thousands of terawatts in just single, um, I think even renewables are, 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 a huge, are a huge in comparison to how much energy Bitcoin uses. It's literally one nuclear power plant. One large nuclear power plant provides the same power as all the computers, roughly. There's some funging in there. Uh, that's interesting from a global politics perspective, I think. There are certain um, dictatorial fellows in the world that maybe have access to nuclear power plants. I wonder what they would do with that. But um, same fraction here, right? 100 to 1,000. Bitcoin can grow by roughly 100 to 1,000 times in terms of its energy usage before it really becomes an appreciable fraction of world energy, right? Um, that's a, just an interesting concordance. Data centers, by the way, use 10 times more energy today. Just another fact. Um, but Bitcoin is an arms race, right? The hash rate is always increasing because there's always marginal utility in acquiring more um, of the relative hash power so you can get more of the reward. Bitcoin miners have even learned that they can mine at a loss for relatively long periods because prices may appreciate and that puts them really back in the green. And so the, the, the emotions and the economics behind this get a little crazy. When does it stop, right? When does this stop? When does Bitcoin stop growing and consuming ever more and more and more and more energy? Um, I think to understand that, you've got to look at energy. How does energy work? Like, where does it come from? We make it somewhere. There's a power generator. There's different cabals that transmit and distribute power. Eventually, it gets all the way down to your home and, and your local substation and your neighborhood. Um, and it's a centralized infrastructure. Um, 
uh, sometimes semi-public or whatever, but like, let's average, and this is just an average number, it's totally different in a lot of places worldwide, I'll have a chart about that in a second. Um, roughly the power company is selling you power at like 10 cents a kilowatt hour or so, right? That's the rough price point. Um, that means they're probably selling it to the distributors and the transmission people and the so on, and maybe seven cents. There's like a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, of a share that the, the networks take. Um, Bitcoin mining earns 25 cents per kilowatt hour right now. Like, again, rough estimate. It depends on the day, the hash power, it's gonna change. There's capital investment, so on. But like, roughly, that's where we're at. I keep saying Bitcoin, by the way. Um, I'm talking, this, Bitcoin is my proof of work example here. I should try to mention that, but, but secretly I'm only talking about Bitcoin. Um, so worldwide electricity prices, all right. So roughly, this is like a chart. Not every country is on here. I think some interesting countries like Nigeria are left off this list. But look, there's a lot of population down here that has really, really cheap electricity. And so those people are able to, right now, if they suddenly decided, those, the power producers in those areas, if they wanted to just throw their kilowatt hours at producing Bitcoins, they would maybe make more money. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, this is not just like a China, India, developing world problem either though, right? Like this is in California, right? This is in a fairly sophisticated power environment. And what we start to see is renewables, right? Solar energy, California, sunny area, oranges. Um, you got um, negative power rates. Power companies will pay you to take energy from them. They can't drop the energy. There's the physics, there's a the thermodynamics, cost associated with things like that. You can't just get rid of it. It has to go somewhere, which means someone has to be paid to take it. So you're talking about literally negative, you know, some number of cents in certain times of the year. This is, a, this is like the worst graph, by the way. Like, this, this, the bars are consecutive years, I guess. Okay. Um, po the, the point is, um, <laughs> sorry, it's the best I could find, guys. Um, the point is, um, there are strong reasons for power companies to want to mine Bitcoin if they could do it. And why don't they do it? Well, they don't really know about it too. But like, they're starting to have had some interesting conversations with folks here where it is beginning. Um, but it's, it's a scale thing. Like Bitcoin, like this is a bad way to do this. But like, if you look at mining revenues, they're like, you know, $6 billion a year or something like that right now. Bitcoin is not perfectly efficient yet. But like, let's just even assume in the worst case scenario that all of that is being spent on electricity. That's not. But let's even assume that it were, it's a tiny fraction of the revenues of electricity companies. They couldn't, even if they wanted to, just start throwing their excess waste energy or trying to game and, 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 and start mining today. There's just not enough liquidity. There's not enough revenues in the entire ecosystem to support that. But Bitcoin is an arms race, right? So it's going to keep growing. It would have to grow by, interestingly, the same factor, roughly 100 to 1,000 times in order for the, the revenues, again, if you assume some sort of perfect saturation, I keep walking, sorry in order for the revenues to approach something interesting for power companies to actually want to get inside of. So this suggests to me that this is a temporal process, that we are in this era today where they don't do it, power companies don't mind Bitcoin in general, but maybe they will. So I introduce to you this metric, the Nakamoto ratio. I refine it as the fraction of world electricity used in proof of work to secure the money supply. All right. Simple definition, right? That number from the energy slide, by the way, is like really small right now. It's like 0 0.001. It's a rate, it's a fraction, so it's like between zero and one. This is not a very precise scale. Um, uh, as I get into it, 2009, it was zero, right? Bitcoin had just come out, just starting out. Um, today, it is like, this is today, it's 0 0.001 roughly, right? It's a, ten, a tenth of a percent world energy, and Bitcoin is roughly uh, $10,000 per coin. Um, I think there's a point, uh, some, there's some future point here that Bitcoin is worth quite a bit more. It's large enough where power companies, some power companies, decide that this is actually an interesting sink for our excess energy. This is an interesting way to perhaps directly, without having to even deal with power transmission or distributors, to get revenues from this resource that is dropping in value because of the distribution effects of green energy. Um, there's some point where they're gonna start mining. And maybe Bitcoin is, I don't know, if you want to reason linearly, that if it's 10 times the world energy, that it's therefore 10 times the price, I don't think that's a fair way of reasoning, but I don't have anything better. Let's maybe say if it hits $100,000 a coin, now we're talking about $60 billion or so a year in revenue, in, in, in inefficiently priced electricity costs, and so maybe that's interesting. Um, so that's my, that's my claim that there are two phases, and we're going to go soon, very soon, my guess, I don't know, 20, 2020s, maybe after the next halvening, when Bitcoin has another spike up. Um, we're gonna transition from a phase in which proof of mining and energy production are two separate industries, and then over time, they're gonna pinch into each other. That energy company's gonna realize they can do proof of work mining, and proof of work miners are going to realize their margins are better if they produce energy. 
Okay, where does this stop? Again, where does it stop? I think it does stop. I think there's a saturation point, and this is what I call the Nakamoto, the saturation point. Here is the Nakamoto point, if you want. Um, it's when the marginal revenue from spending a kilowatt hour on proof of work mining is equal to the revenues earned by selling that kilowatt hour on the grid. Like, and if, if we reach that point, Bitcoin's gotta be worth quite a bit more, it's gotta be using a lot more of the world energy supply, but if it does get there, uh, my conjecture, no proof, just gut instinct, my conjecture is that is a stable point, that somehow having saturated this bound, like the, the, the universes of energy production and the money supply will be kind of concordant. And at that point, we will just use that amount of energy forevermore to protect our money supply. Maybe we'll argue about it, like it'll be like an inflation rate, it'll be like a base economic parameter that people like decide that they want to try to influence through policy during periods of great expansion. If we go to space or whatever, I can imagine us spending a lot more of our energy budget on world, real world things, but I think there's just a balance point. I don't know, I don't know that this is actually the figure, it's just a conjecture that it exists. Okay, that's scheme one. How am I doing on time? That's pretty good, holy shit. It's really unstable, guys. Wow, okay, this is scheme two. I call this chain lightning. I stole this comic from SMBC, which I love. Uh, it was originally about physics, but I repurposed it to be about blockchain mesh networking, which I do think is fucking awesome. Um, I'm gonna try and motivate a little bit of discussion about networking and how I think blockchains help us get there, right? And remember, I, 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 I'm crazy. I believe Bitcoin is gonna be the basis of the world economy. I think the entire energy production apparatus will turn to mining large amounts of Bitcoin. So I do believe blockchains have the ability to, to move atoms, right, and, and really reconfigure the world. And so I think some, some of the things I'm about to propose, while they're a little outlandish today, people are working on them and I think they are going to exist. But let me first quickly review with you, what is Bitcoin like in terms of um, the data structure? Because in order to have this conversation, I'm gonna have to route a little bit through um, some of what's happening right now in Bitcoin's development. So it's, it's a ledger. Like what is a ledger? It's a list of, and I, I, I've, I've simplified it here, but which transaction ID, which output of that transaction, script, which is really address, addresses are just scripts, simplifying, and some amount, right? So in this case, the address 1AB has like, you know, a bunch of coins in it, right? It's got the sum of those. Um, and then you can cross entries out in the ledger as they get used up. And really, all Bitcoin is, is it is a consensus, it's a shared ledger of title to these Bitcoins that are constantly being transferred amongst people. And consensus and proof of work, just a way to keep this list shared and, cur and current amongst all participants in the network. And it's extremely slow, right? The, the, whatever you believe about the Bitcoin cash utility whole thing, if my reading of the white paper, despite words like cash and peer-to-peer, -peer, is that you built a system that's fucking slow and, and, and prizes uh, re uh, censorship resistance and decentralization, distribution, redundancy of data over almost every other possible feature. So what you've built is this. You've built the, the most robust way to share a list of information. And this is what you choose, <coughs> excuse me, to put in that list. So, I, I had a comment yesterday in Kyle's talk about, about layers and lightning, and, and this is really part of why I believe that, is, is I think the lightning network is a really compelling extension to the idea of having consensus about a list like this. What is the lightning network? Um, it is composed of two different concepts. One is the lightning, and the other is the network. Right, and this is kind of a funny ha-ha, finger cuffs, but like, it's kind of like that, right? A bi-directional payment channel is a relationship that two participants in the network enter into in which they lock funds together, that's like the finger cuffs, they're locked, um, and they can poke each other. They're gonna be like, hey, so I'll send you a little bit, okay, cool, I'll update our IOUs. I'll send you a little bit, okay, I'll update our IOUs. The crucial part about it is there's no consensus mechanism. Those channels are private, right? Like, there's no having to settle that to the chain, there's no proof of work mining, that's not how it works. It's just using some of the basic protocol features of Bitcoin that this ledger provides, it's locking some funds together and exchanging IOUs. That's the lightning, right? The network is a literal network of these bi-directional payment channels. And so now when I get poked, I, I can just poke you and then you can poke some other guy that you have a channel with and we can exchange a series of pokes uh, and that's how we move uh, funds online. And none of that is, has any consensus about it. That's 100% just driven by like how quickly we can exchange that information and telecommunications transfer time. So it can be extremely fast. It can be on the order of milliseconds to seconds. Um, and then you still get the protection of the underlying chain because there's a feature built in. This is part of why we needed segregated witness to be able to do this, backstory. Um, there's a feature built in that if someone tries to break that channel, that because it's distributed, if they try to cheat and get out of the IOU network, you can flush it and you can sort of have some strong guarantees 
that um, when ev whenever your, your channel's sequence of IOUs settles back to the Bitcoin blockchain, it's gonna be what you expected. So I'm not gonna get into any of the details of how this works. Um, I think the lightning part is uncontroversial. You could have built the lightning part in 2013 using email, right? That's, and the, the core protocol just provides you the primitives to do that. The network part, that's the interesting part. That's the hard part. Like, there's some visualization. It's like a hairball, I don't know what that is. It's like the lightning network today, right? And there's all these, like, things out there. <clears throat> the lightning network is centralized, right? Like, this fucking guy. Like, mathematical proof. Dude, if you publish your mathematical proof on Medium, it's not a mathematical proof. That's my, that's, that's my strong feeling. Um, and whatever, this article makes some good points that, like, some people do, lightning supporters, do have this, I think, absurd and, and, and false idea that the Lightning Network is like this totally distributed mesh. No, it cannot be that. Like, like the, in order to scale, it is making a trade-off. It is saying that we don't deal with consensus at the base layer, we flush out to that, and we replace it with a certain degree of centralization in order to allow greater throughput. The miracle part is, like, what is the right, me like the hard part, excuse me, is what is the right measure of that centralization? It is insufficient and unnuanced to say that it is or is not centralized. Like, define that term for me. Like, part of my own uh, background as a physicist is, is trying to measure and, and define and, and, and think, think about how to construct networks with particular transport properties, and, and there's no one definition of this term that is sufficient. So there needs to be an application-specific definition that we think is correct. Um, and users need choice. Given that we are centralizing here, like, if we centralize with an inability for users to, let's say, not route through PayPal's Lightning Hub, like, because they know they're gonna get, like, all sorts of weird tracking or whatever applied to them, if they would prefer to route through totally private, dark net Lightning Hubs, they should have that option, um, in my opinion. Um, and so the software being able to actually provide you this level of control on how you choose to route, who you choose to connect to, is I think extremely important. And furthermore, can, does the economic incentives, the Lightning Network has all sorts of different free structure, it's, I'm not gonna get into the details, but they, there are some details there. Are those details correct? Are they going to encourage the kind of growth that someone like me is gonna wanna see, which is to say, um, centralized but not totally controlled. Decentralized as compared to distributed, right? Um, it's interesting that all the existing implementations today of, of the Lightning Network concept, none of them really tackles this problem, right? Like, where we currently stand with Lightning is where we've got channels and they seem to be working. We have a basic ability to network together, but it's extremely inefficient and not scalable at the moment. So it's okay, it's a first draft, it's fine. But I'd like to see the clients develop a more sophisticated ability for users to, one, just in general have decentralized routing, something closer to BGP, if you're familiar with how that works, but then also, um, have the ability to, to put it, to route with metadata for there to be in a way for them to, to determine what routes meet their own needs. So engineering and experimentation is required. All right, fine. Let's pretend this works. Let's move on. Like increasing the bullshit quotient a bit, right? Let's say this works. Um, what can happen? Um, can we build a distributed mesh network? What do I mean by mesh network? I, I mean literally not like, the, this is the graph of the internet, it kind of looks like a mesh a little bit, right? This is a telecommunications network that we're all using, we're using it right now. Um, it looks a little bit meshy, but it's not. Like you can do a trace route if you want. You can, it's built out of all these things called autonomous systems, these internet, it's in the name, right? Like between the networks, right? There are a sequence or a collection of largely independent networks that, route, that the internet routes traffic between. So it's kind of like a mesh in a way that like there's no one network, but really it's not. It is extremely centralized, again, using some appropriate measure of centralization. Think about things like undersea cables, which route traffic, satellites, which are owned by just a few companies, um, the fact that telecom, like, like to, to the last mile is a monopoly in many areas, and that everyone's traffic gets routed through the same switching centers locally. Like, it, it's not as decentralized as it could be if we lived in a world where every single human being, like, just had a router on that was providing a mesh network exchanging bits locally. Now, what's frustrating about that is the technology to build such a thing has existed for a long time. Like, we know about wireless networking, we know about, like, dist distributed routing, like, we, we, we could have built a wireless network a, a, excuse me, a mesh network that was global, like if we, if, if we had the economic incentives to, and we didn't. Like the only way to build telecommunications network has been to take massive amounts of capital, go out there, build a network with wires and, and satellites and all sorts of stuff, and then charge rent in order to get it all back. And so that's what's happened. That's how telecom works today. Um, there is no economic layer in the OSI model for how to transmit data over computer networks. Um, and if such a layer existed, I think, and I'm, the, I'm not, this is not my idea, I'm just capitulating some of the information for, uh, for you guys. Um, 
it would potentially allow us to incentivize people to operate uh, equipment in the real world to go build these networks. It might incentivize them to go purchase um, EM spectrum that they themselves could use to broadcast signals on a mesh network that they are compensated for um, packet per packet. Um, there's a lot of, you know, we can get into these, you can imagine how things like messaging and content delivery networks and, and social networks and knowledge, all these things have really interesting analogs in a world where it's not all being streamed out of some central server. Um, and I also think, by the way, that one of the common um, criticisms of mesh networking in general is how are we going to have mesh flicks, right? Like how are we going to stream stuff, all these content things all the way across to everybody, the millions of people that want to watch Game of Thrones right fucking now. Um, how are we going to do that on a mesh network that is inherently more inefficient? I think that's a little bit almost not believing in the distribution protocols enough. Why can't the mesh network also incentivize the mesh distribution and delivery of data that is encrypted and then unlocked at purchasing time but streamed from someone nearby to you in the mesh? If we're all watching Game of Thrones tonight, that means that data only needs to get shipped to our neighborhood truly once, and then we can just exchange it with each other. So I don't really believe the idea that telecommunications and like packet accounting is, has to be separate from data accounting. I think they're naturally the same thing, especially in a distributed network. You're ultimately just looking for a distributed way to route to a resource, which could be a server that gives you something, quote unquote, over the net, or it could just be data. I mean, there's still just information and bits that are traveling over the same mesh. So I think integrating all that, having an economic incentive layer, this is a really powerful way to build a next generation, uh, more distributed, fairer, um, less, less, I keep saying we're centralized, but what do I mean? Let, let's, why is that important, right? Let's go back to that, that comic from the beginning. Like, why do we actually want to build a mesh network? Like, why do we really, other than it's fucking awesome. Um, I think, I, I mean, all the things that we like, that I like about sound money, apply to communication. Like it must, we, sh we want it to be robust. We do not want to be censored. We do not want to be silenced. We want to be able to attribute our statements um, in a world of increasing duplicity. Um, we may even require such a network to preserve the sound money itself. Like in the, in the outline, in, in, the, in the prior scheme, if energy is, if, if Bitcoin's going up by factors of 10 and 100, um, it's changing the world and there's going to be some violence as a result. Like we may need a network like this to preserve our ability to transact in Bitcoin or other networks in the first place. Um, and let me also offer you a political just snapshot in time of why I think right now is an interesting period in which mesh networking should really evolve and grow um, and just a you know, little framework action outcome like uh, you know, paranoia act solution. Um, Gold and money, right? Divorcing these are executive orders from FDR and Nixon, like saying essentially we are off the gold standard. You citizens and then followingly nation states could no longer demand gold from you, from holding U.S. government uh, denominated currency. Um, so we get things like the ability to print lots of money, the 2008 bailouts, like quantitative easing. Go look at the chart. Like the amount of money now is crazy compared to what it was before. And I don't understand economics well enough to like what like, what is the impact of that. But it can't be good, guys. It can't be good. So what happens? Some nut comes up with Bitcoin. Like that's a thing now. He's like, oh, fuck, I gotta solve this. Okay, great. Um, there's a parallel story, right, that's happening in telecommunications. Things like the Patriot Act, Citizens United, the ability for money, politics, control of information, uh, monitoring of the citizenry. Uh, that's, all, that, that's how it is now. We, we, are, we, we all said we were okay with that. And so now what do we get? We get Snowden, we get the 2016 election, we have Cambridge Analytica, there's more coming. Like, at, a lot of us have worked in this industry and our, our hands are not exactly clean. And in part of this, I would, I would probably even admit about myself. Um, how much is this a political issue for people? Like, I don't know, I, I'm, I don't know, like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't someone for whom in 2008 Bitcoin was a significant political issue, so I don't know, but there's some response to this, like, and the response is this notion of a mesh, a network that cannot have a, uh, a, a Snowden revealing that the government has been spying on everybody because they don't have the capability to do so because of the ability for people to route effectively just like in the Lightning Network. I'm gonna have to move faster. Um, all right, quick points. How do you actually build this thing? Let's say you wanted to and you decided it was politically the time to do it. How would you build it? Would you release your own blockchain with a consensus algorithm and tokens? I don't think so. I think you build it as a lightning network. Because what is the data that's being exchanged in the lightning? It's, a, it's, it's the same idea of a, of a purpose-built transactional network that has no internal consensus model that settles into a lower layer for all of its accounting. And the information exchange in lightning transactions is just IOU. It's, it's numerical differences. 
right? That data can be richer. It can be blocks of text. It can be packets of information. You can still use a lightning-like channel-based routing mechanism that uses an internal IOU mechanism that still settles out to an underlying chain in order to build these kinds of systems. I mean, lightning, just like blockchains themselves, it's a new kind of technology. You should not expect there to be one. Like, if someone can show that it actually works, there will be many, and we will figure out different kind of rules, and there will be, like, some new bloom in, like, silly lightning networks that are, are terrible and have bad acronyms. Um, but there's a problem, right? It doesn't really work as simply as that, because, like, there's a time scale issue, right? Bitcoin's uh, consensus model is going to get you consensus in, like, minutes to hours, and that's why you go and build lightning, so that you can have certainty about your coffees that you're buying, because everyone loves coffee so much in crypto. Um, you get consensus about that in a few seconds. It could be even faster, but no matter how really fast it is, it's, 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 un, it's untenable to me to imagine a real mesh network that is using packet routing, which every packet corresponds to a lightning level transaction. I think the more reasonable um, picture is like layers of such lightning networks. That what you see is there's an analogy between establishing a connection to a mesh node and finding a route through a lightning network. And now in your like, sort of layer three mesh network, you can exchange packets and keep like an IOU sort of chain going, and then you can periodically settle at the close of connection or every n kilobytes of data transferred, and that transaction is a lightning transaction, and then eventually that even itself will settle into Bitcoin. So I really view like this is a good idea. Let's reutilize this concept and build more and more layers on top of what ultimately is becoming a stronger base of value. You can sort of see why I believe some of the things I do about the size um, and longevity of Bitcoin. Let's gonna move faster. Let's, let's go quickly through time. Um, Bitcoin, um, that's what we start with. I think that's the base layer. I said this in my comment yesterday. Um, Lightning Network, that's a, that's a transactional locking IOU layer built on top of it. I think on top of that, as I've tried to discuss now, you get a mesh network for data and telecommunications. What comes on top of that? Applications. Once you can actually incentivize people to store large amounts of data, and you can incentivize them to exchange bandwidth with each other, you have a substrate, you have a cloud, like an actual cloud. Cloud. The real cloud, by the way, should be called the fucking mine, because that's like really what it is. Like this is actually a cloud, right? This is distributed, this is out there, this is on people's homes and computers and devices. Um, if you have that, if you can monetize that and you've built the economic incentives for that to exist, now your application layer has got some legs to it, right? You can actually build really useful applications that store significant amounts of data because you've like gone through this inductive process of building these layers. Um, so it's a chain of settlement layers anchored in a proof of work blockchain. This is what I see it developing into. And of course it all depends on the internet. Like the mesh, like Bitcoin transacts on the internet. Lightning network transacts on Bitcoin and the internet. The mesh itself, the likely first use cases are just gonna be getting to the fucking internet, right? So the internet is vital to this whole scheme, yet I think it can be bootstrapping. I think the mesh itself can be self-hosted at some point. Now that starts to get really exciting because now there are no apps. If, if that is the world we live in, if Lightning Network has grown that large, Bitcoin has grown that large, this is many, many years from now, you now have a self-hosted, completely distributed mesh network that settles into Lightning, which settles into Bitcoin, which is itself transacting on the mesh. Um, maybe it sounds crazy, but I think it's a cool way to build it. Um, and I think anchoring all of this in the concept of value solves a lot of endemic problems that currently exist in the world of technology, right? You don't get, like, personal data collection as easily because I'm having to pay you everything that you collect about me, and if I habitually visit sites that are sucking everything about me out, it's going to deplete my own mesh account. And that's something that maybe I'm incentivized to prevent from happening. Like, <coughs> software bloat, can we just, like, add more libraries to this? You have to pay for it. Like, maybe think about that more. Be a little bit more conservative about your underscore.js. DDoS has no cost today. It would have a tremendous cost in a network in which traffic is metered, security, like, Right now, if they steal your like Twitter password, it's embarrassing. If, if that means they can steal your Bitcoin, like maybe you are way more anal about like the demands that you make on the services that you use in terms of security. Um, I think Ethereum, by the way, is doing this backwards. Like, I think they're starting at the top and they're saying, let's just build the app layer because we're so desperately eager for turning complete computation and like everything else will just materialize below us and we'll somehow scale everything up at the same time. Um, I'm an ETH holder, like, I, I'm a Solidity programmer, like, I'm part of it, but um, I think it's backwards. But maybe, let's find out. Um, oh man. Keep going, don't stop. All right, so I have three more schemes. One is about identity, it's called humanity. Has anybody played this game Dark Souls? No? I am a nerd amongst nerds. <laughs> My man Toby, 
All right, cool. Let's talk about strength builds later. Um, I have this one, and then I have one about space, and I have one about quantum mechanics. I don't know if I can get through all three, dude. Just go, roll. Okay, here's what I like about Dark Souls. It's a silly video game for dorks, but it has this really cool concept where, just Dark Souls, well, Dark Souls 1, guys, OG. Um, uh, wh when you die, you become inhuman. You become hollow, and, and the game is single player. And you kind of poke around, and you have to kill the enemies, and like, you have to get some resource. The resource is humanity. It's called humanity. It's like, it's, a, it's the shard of some massive soul that is split out across the world. And if you get humanity, you can, you can I don't know, eat it, and then you become human, right? And once you're human, the game is multiplayer. And now you can go battle humans, you can cooperate with them, PvE, PvP. Um, if you kill them uh, in PvP, you get humanity. So there's this like token uh, humanity that is exchanged in this network. And what's cool about it is like the multiplayer, single player divide. It's like the identity and your relationship to all the other players is determined by this shared resource and this humanity that you're always exchanging in this semi-adversarial, semi-cooperative kind of fashion. It's like kind of a cool game that way. Um, and it got me thinking a lot about how identity works, uh, specifically around blockchains. So this is like, I'm gonna, again, go fast. Um, me, that's me, that's really me, that's, I'm, that's my identity. Um, and then there's like identifiers that I have, like my email address, like a public key like that one, whatever, um, all sorts of stuff. And then there's all these other things, like my data, data about me, like what is my reputation, how cool am I, 10 out of 10, by the way, guys. Um, that's actually 10 out of 10 factorial. Um, my network. <laughs> Like, who, who knows me? Who hangs out with me, right? Attestations, attestations about me, right? Like, uh, where do I live? What about, do I own this, right? Physi my, my relationship to physical things in the world, right? Like, things made of matter, like homes, cars. Um, it seems to me that when people contemplate blockchain and identity, they do, they do this, they go, you are made of meat, we can't deal with you. Like, you're not even part of this. Uh, your identifier is good, that's a solved problem. That is you, you are a private key. Um, and let's just move on and let's start solving all those other problems um, because there's like no money to be made maybe in identifiers. But I posit to you, I'm not a private key, I am a man. And I feel it's, it's reductive to, to turn me into one. Um, and besides, like public, private keys, this is kind of a solved problem, right? This is like, everyone thinks this. Um, why, what do, you, what do you need a blockchain for to do authentication? Like we've had all sorts of schemes, all of them terrible, um, for how to authenticate in networks and so on. There's a new one, distributed ID. This is an example of a bare bones DID document. What is it? What is it? It's public keys, right? And then various additional data about you. Like, there's no need for a token here. I can understand why there's a need for a token in like attestations about me, my reputation, all those applications of identity, but it doesn't seem like a token is actually needed for identity. But mm, I actually disagree because none of those other systems, again, think about the idea of loss. Like, they again assume that I am a private key. If I am lost, like, I'm out of the network. It's over, I can't sign anything more. I lose the ability to decrypt any of the data I've created with that key. And also, interestingly, I lose the ability to prove that I am that identifier, because I don't have the key anymore. Um, I think this is, like, the problem with identity. I think there's no other problem that needs to be solved more than this problem, which is, what happens when people lose their keys? I think everything else needs to sit on top of that, and I think if you really get into how to solve that problem in a distributed way, you get a solution that really does demand a blockchain. First problem is not fixable, by the way. If you encrypted something with a private key and you lose, I can't get it back, done, no, no token, not, not a problem. This problem is fixable. If you lose your identifier, we can get you a new one, oftentimes. How do we do that? In centralized systems, we issue you a new one. There's an identity provider. It's Google, it's the government, it's your company, it's something. Um, you talk to them, you're a human, right? You leverage you the social weight of identity, other identity things around you, and you convince them. Um, and uh, that's not how it works in blockchains. In distributed systems, you lose your private key, you don't have the coins, gone. And that's kind of maybe acceptable for fungible tokens, because they're fungible, so if you lose these, the rest of them can like pick up the slack, so to speak. Um, for things that are fungible, this is like a non-starter. For CryptoKitties, like if you lose them, they're gone, right? Like, and CryptoKitties are whatever, they're CryptoKitties. But like, uh, you know, if I lose my private keys, like, or if I, use, if, I, if I lose my house keys, right, that's okay, I have a friend that has a copy, I can get back in. If I lose the private keys to my house, like, what does that mean? Is it my house? Like, whose house is it? Is it gone? Is it no longer ownable? Like, th this is like a fundamental problem when you think about how to relate fun, like broken meatbag humans into like the world of cathedral-like, you know, blockchain, um, stuff. So, can blockchain provide an economic context in which to solve this problem? I think the answer is yes, presenting humanity. It's a blockchain that I'm never going to build because 
but I did want to talk about. Um, let's say we have two identities, A, B, C, D, E, F, these are the two identities. Um, let's go ahead and have a token. Yeah, we love token. The token is called humanity, and we have balances of it in these identities. They exist. Uh, we can send each other, um, you know, humanity and transactions. We can have an economic layer about it. Um, went too far. Um, identities can spend humanity to update their public key. So just like that DID document, we're gonna have the data of this blockchain in addition to addresses, accounts, and, and balances also have a public key just associated with each address. That public key is changeable. You can spend money to change it. I also assert that you can make links amongst identities by spending humanity. Okay, so it costs money to create links between you, and then why do you want to do that? Um, because there's a rekey primitive. I think that the cool solution here is you can make like a kind of protection against Sybil attacks. You make it so that neighbors of an identity can update the public key associated with that identity by spending humanity. Now that's a really interesting way to uh, have a locally changeable but globally um, uh, immutable ledger that associates two identities, the A, B, and C, the, pub the identifier, the public key. And I think this is extremely powerful, like, because if done correctly, these links that we're creating, these aren't like Facebook friends. These are more like people you give your house keys a copy to, right? These are people that you extremely, extremely trust because they can unlock, should you be robbed or, or be stolen from, they can unlock every aspect of your digital identity by rekeying you. And it has to be an economic transaction, otherwise it, the, it suffers from being able to be civil attack, right? Like we can just DDoS and hackers can rekey each other. If people really believe humanity is valuable, then this kind of behavior can be incentivized. Details, don't know, right? Like, like maybe if you have multiple connections, we do some average, like whatever, like there's some minimum cost, maybe there's some unrecoverable aspect to this. If you are the kind of person that is every week losing your keys, like eventually your friends should stop vouching for you. Um, like this humanity is in some sense a little bit of a vouchsafing tool. Um, trust domains, like you can have your root identity that like people are vouching for and that is recoverable and you can have from it daughter identities that only your identity could ever rekey. So you're able to have private systems that only you can control but if you get locked out you can use this economically motivated rekeying mechanism to recover that root account and then go ahead and control your accounts the same way. Um, I think it's the same, it's the same idea um, it's just when you anchor it in this idea of a, a, a system that solves this distributed rekeying problem, everything else makes so much more sense. Like now if I lose the private key to my thing, I don't lose my house, I just call up my friends and say, hey man, it's a disaster, like can you guys do this? And it might cost them real money, I might have to pay them back, but they know that I will because they trust me. We're using real world social trust as a proxy for how to rekey each other. Um, and I think this is like the basis for future things like political representation and stuff, which I don't have time to get into. And I'm super late already. Do you guys want to see this one? <laughs> yeah? Fucking Ferengis. All right, dude. Um, all right, I'll go, sorry, fuck, I'll go fast. Um, all right, what is, there, if there, there's money in space, what is it made of, right? It can't be stuff. Like the Ferengis, the Jews of space, this like horrible anti-Semitic stereotype. What do these guys actually need this stuff for? Like, it's like, it's, in Star Trek, it's like on metal, I don't, I don't know. But this makes sense to me, because physical stuff is not something you can move among the stars cost effectively. Money has got to be information in the future. It's got to be, right? And now, that statement maybe didn't make sense very directly 10, 15 years ago, but I think we all know what I mean by that, right? There's a blockchain context in which information can be money, and that is useful for space. But a problem, right, like, space is big. Right? It takes a lot of time to move signals between the stars, and any system for value transfer has to contend with this problem. Let's look at two quick paradoxes, right? Like finite speed of light. Um, this is a space-time diagram. If you're a physicist, you immediately can read this. If you're not, I'm not gonna have time to get into it, but let's just say, imagine you leave Earth, you go to Alpha Centauri, on the way there, you use a laser needle cast, and you send back a transaction paying off all your debts on Earth. Um, but only Earth knows about that transaction, you get to Alpha Centauri, it's gonna take four or five years for Earth to relay that fact back to Alpha Centauri. You can live like a king and double spend all those same credits while you're at Alpha Centauri at the bar, right? And the challenge with that is, like, there's no centralized system which solves this. Like, this, the bank can't prevent this from happening. Like, because it's an information problem. Like, when ships travel at close to the speed of light and stars are so, so apart, and we still experience time in the same way, we're gonna have a transaction time which is infinitesimal compared to the communication time amongst ledgers, right? Another paradox, there's the relativity of simultaneity, right? Like every cool paradox in relativity boils down to this concept, is that simultaneity is not an absolute idea. When things are in relative motion, they think things which are the same time are different times. It's very interesting. Um, so if you have two ships that are making this journey in opposite directions, 
um, and both home planets send them a signal, they will receive those signals in the opposite order. Like how are they able to, how are they supposed to arrive at a consensus model of finance if that, if, 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 the, if time ordering is up for debate, right? Challenges. So these are extreme scales. How can a blockchain help? Like, okay, blockchains can solve this problem by forcing essentially integration time, right? Like you wait for multi-year transactions, right? You wait for decades for those transactions to fully confirm, and you have hash power on the Kardashev scale, right? This is incredible. Like, I think this is so cool. Definitely going to happen. Um, and I'll, I'll just I'll just make the point that like going back to energy for a second. If y'all are butthurt about how much energy Bitcoin is using right now, just like just wait a little bit. And I'll, and I'll also make the point that, like, let's not confuse dirty energy with clean energy, right? Using a lot of dirty energy is fucked up and sucks. But just using free energy that's otherwise just floating out into space to secure the money supply, that doesn't sound like a problem to me. And it is awesome to do it at this scale. Um, another comment to make is you can't solve these, like, fundamental problems of time delay by having fucking bigger blocks or some dumbass thing like this. Like, this is a fundamental limitation to the nature of space and time. You must build layers if you would like to transact more quickly than this. There's no other solution. So like, just, I know this is not space, but like go back to what it is, like, like 10 minutes and so on. Like think about like the implications of an extreme model like this for the real model that we're trying to solve. That's like a very physics thing to do. It's like ignore everything, extremize one variable, see what the solution is, project it back onto the reality. Um, I also think long time scales is something we have to get used to in space. Like, it's big, we're gonna live for thousands of years. Um, it's gonna take hundred, you know, tens to hundreds of years to move between the stars. That's like a cathedral mindset. And I think there's, a, like, if we really do have blockchain feudalism, like, this is an interesting model for how we can start building space, space cathedrals. Um, okay, that's, uh, I can do this in like two minutes. That's my last one. I, okay, so hash of the future. This is a cool Quora question, I like this one. Um, what if Toshi was a time traveler and he came back in time and he invented Bitcoin and he's gonna pop out in like 2150 when we have the 21 millionth Bitcoin that gets mined. Um, and then he's going to implement basic income for everyone and save the world and all the angels sang, so saith the great Satoshi. Um, I don't really believe that, guys. Um, but let me, let, me, let me get into some weird time stuff. Uh, uh, how does all of physics work? Basically two laws. There's Noether's theorem. This says to every symmetry of space and time and, um, and I suppose fields, there corresponds a conserved quantity. I won't go through all of these. The fact that the world is the same here as it is here, translation in space, means that linear momentum is conserved. The fact that it's the same here as it is here means that rotational momentum or angular momentum is conserved. There's a bunch of mathematical objects, like if you remember your electromagnetics, the phase of a wave is sort of irrelevant. Turns out the conserved quantity associated with that. The circular symmetry of phase is electric charge. Okay, cool, bunch of coaches. Stuff is conserved, right? It has to balance. Um, Feynman's sum over past. Reality is the mutual interference of every possible thing happening at once. All right, this is a reasonable interpretation of how quantum mechanics actually works. How does the particle get from A to B? It does every possible path, and, and even ones that are classically forbidden, ones that haven't traveled faster than the speed of light, and then how do we calculate the actual path? It, they all interfere with each other, and we have like a rule, an optimization function, which helps us pick out the contributions of that interference, and we wind up with the classical path. So when you look at the way the particle physicists do like physics, like what they're doing is they're saying, okay, here are two electrons, they come in, they have a photon that goes between them, they go off, this is one combination, they integrate over all possible such combinations and average them all together, and at each vertex, and each path, everything has to balance, right? So the way I think about that now is nature is an adversarial system that is adopting a consensus algorithm designed to prevent double spending, <laughs> right? That at each vertex here, like momentum in has to equal momentum out, charge in has to equal charge out, yet you have crazy shit happening, supposedly, um, in which that doesn't happen. Like, you, you violate those rules of double spending. You, you manufacture more charge than you came in with. Nature has to sort all this out. And, and I'm not saying it's a blockchain, guys, but it's an interesting parallel. Um, I'll, one more idea, time entanglement. This is really cool. Um, let's say, so, um, conservation laws, right? Let's say they have a thing that has two states. It's like plus and minus. Um, and conservation law tells you it, it always got to add up to zero. If you have a plus, you got to have a minus, right? You might have heard of entanglement in space, spooky action at a distance, right? So if you have something here, and let's say you, you, you entangle these two particles somehow, whatever that means, just pretend, pretend that you know what that word means. And then you have these two things, and you entangle them, and then if you measure one here, there's this rule that says over there, it's going to be the opposite because of this conservation law, right? It has to balance in some weird way, and there it can be really far away. It can be further uh, away than light had time to travel, and, and what does that mean? Can you use this to exchange information? Physicists have been arguing about this for a long time. I, I think this shit is fucking mysterious. I don't really know the answers. To be honest with you, um, I do still find it spooky even having years of thought about it. It turns out we now have this new idea. 
that like you can entangle something now and then later like the thing that you measure has to be the thing that balances it. And with the same degrees of certainties, and essentially this is a new concept of entanglement through time here and later, or now and later, as compared to entanglement in space um, here and there. Right, and it, it's sort of being loose, but uh, the future can be known in certain cases with uh, specially prepared states with certainty in the same way that the past can be known. Okay, so that's interesting, all right? Um, I'm not gonna talk about this. It's gonna, it's gonna take too long. Google Feynman-Wheeler absorber theory. Um, maybe inertia is just signals from the future. That's what it means. But I, I, I'll just close because I've taken a whole hour. Um, today's blocks are secure because they are the tip of a long, heavy proof-of-work chain of blocks going into the past. Okay, that is why we believe in the security of Bitcoin. What if, guys, what if each block were constrained by all possible future blocks using quantum timing entanglement in such a way that things like 51% attacks are impossible to achieve because you can't change the current history because it's anchored for all time, like out until we get to space and we're going to Alpha Centauri and whatever else. I, I don't know, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, <laughs> that's it, that's all I got, guys. I'm sorry that, that took too long. Okay, so I had um, a lot of questions, but I'm just gonna ask them. <laughs> okay. Can you talk more about blockchain feudalism and space cathedrals, because that sounds kind of fun. I think if the economy collapses and you have trillionaires that are built off of Bitcoin, that's not gonna be a better and more fair world. It's gonna be a less fair world. Um, maybe in the long, long, long run, it gets more fair, but it feels like to me, um, any universe in which Bitcoin really is worth millions of dollars a coin, and hyper Bitcoinization and things like that have occurred, is a universe in which most people's savings were reduced to zero. Um, that, that creates an unhappy world of powerless people and rich titans. Um, and I don't trust rich titans, um, but I do think that rich titans, like kings and priests of yesteryear, are motivated by ego and their place in history, and they're willing to pay and fund and manipulate people to large start projects, which may call, take hundreds of years to complete witness things like medieval cathedrals and so on, and perhaps, perhaps people's egos are the only kinds of things that have the longevity to spend that much money to get us into space and go places. And so I'm sort of, I don't know, not looking forward to it. I've got some Bitcoins, so maybe I'll be like a duke, I think. <laughs> this, this whole scheme somewhere, I don't know. It's a pessimistic outlook. Questions? We should eat, guys. Yeah, I think everybody's hungry. Okay, that's it. Questions? More questions? I missed the beginning of your talk, so maybe you answered this, but um, I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on like how the physics and proof of stake sort of work together. Physics and proof of stake. Where um, like all the security is contained within the network, right? You don't mm -hmm. have this tie to the real world. Mm, I'm trying to connect it to physics. Um, it feels like proof of stake, um, I, can have, like, I can make a bad physics analogy, so I won't, but it feels like proof of stake is a totally sensible system for when you don't need like the extreme levels of like robustness and um, the degree of history preservation that proof of work provides. Like one thing that, you know, you, you can't just take, you know, Bitcoin's Blockchain today is like 200 gigabytes on disk. You can't just go manufacture 200 gigabytes on disk that has the same difficulty numbers as Bitcoin's blockchain does. No one can create such a digital thing. It's not possible to do so. It is possible to trivially manufacture a proof of stake chain that is arbitrarily long, that has an arbitrary history. The reason you know you're on the real chain is because you're in the network and you trust people. I don't think that's a killer failing. Like you have to trust people to get the right Bitcoin D software, like et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's a totally reasonable solution when like, you don't need like sound money, right? So I think there's lots of applications. I noticed I didn't mention this humanity like thing of like what actual chain does it run on? Like, I don't know. I think proof of stake is a reasonable choice for something like that. Um, but I, I personally prefer proof of work for um, Kardashev type two civilizations. Yeah, 